All of this grain sitting behind me is old. A buttload of it is actually completely out of date. Some of it's just orphaned and doesn't really have a purpose. I could let it sit there. I could throw it out. Or we could throw a Hail Mary, pop it into a mash tun, see if it'll turn into a mongrel whiskey. No recipe, no real idea what I'm doing. I'm just crossing my fingers. How's it going chasers? I hope you're having a kick-ass week. I'm Jesse, this is still it, and today we are making a mongrel whiskey. What do I mean by that? I just mean that it's got no pedigree. I don't know what on earth it's going to be when it pops out, and um, I'll love it anyway. <laughs> uh, doing what I do, I tend to end up with little odds and ends of different grains. I'll order something and uh, decide to change the recipe right before I make it. Or some wonderful person will give me something to play with and it doesn't end up fitting into plans that I have, so on and so forth. For whatever reason, I've got all of this grain sitting around uh, and some of it is horribly out of date. Some of it is actually fairly fresh. There's nothing particularly wrong with it. It's just orphaned and in a volume where I'm not likely to actually use it. Like uh, some torrified wheat or some kibbled corn or steam flecked barley. So I gave everything the sniff test and a little taste test. Some of it's not exactly vibrant and super fresh, but it all tastes fine. So why not use it up? By definition, I don't think there's any real right way to do this. So I'm just going to grab bags. I am going to weigh them and record what I'm putting into the fermenters as a whole, not each individual fermenter. Purely so if something amazing happens, we'll see about that. Uh, I've got some record of what I used. If there's an interesting flavor that pops up, I can maybe trace it back to what caused it or, or what created that flavor. Uh, but I'm just grabbing bags, weighing them out, grinding them up, and then uh, we'll start getting them into the fermenters. So far, I've managed to uh, select out about 14, 15 kilos of grain grind it up and I'm going to mash into the Brusilla first because this is the only mash tun I've got that will look after temperature by itself. I'm just going to throw the grain in there, forget about it. <laughs> anyway, let's get started. Just like always, the plan is to add the grain in nice and slow while stirring to avoid dough balls. I just checked the notes. Uh, that's 14 kilos of grain in there, which is pretty impressive. It's a thick mash, don't get me wrong. I'm just gonna let this circulate away and do its own thing, basically, until I'm finished with everything else. This will be the last one I pull out. If uh, all of that grain actually has the diastatic power it should have, which it won't, that'll convert fine. I don't know what's gonna happen. <laughs> Mash tun number two is now all go, uh, but I did guesstimate the strike water temp for this, uh, and I've missed it by about two degrees. It's at 62 degrees now. I'll get it up to 64, I'll be happy with that. Uh, so, luckily there is a false bottom on the bottom of this and I can keep the elements running. Not a problem. There is nine kilos of grain in this. I could fit more, but to use up the grain that I want to use, I need to use another mash tun anyway, so I'm just going to go over to that one. It turns out I'm an absolute muppet and I managed to lose the audio for this clip along with the b-roll so apologies for that but now you've got me in voiceover. I was explaining that I was mashing in primarily with pilsner and peated malt for this one and it smelt absolutely glorious. I also lost the b-roll for insulating all of the fermenters and letting them sit for an hour. Apologies. Uh, but I've just done a starch test on all three of the mash tons and all three Looks like they have full conversion, which is pretty freaking cool. Uh, all that's left to do now is get them out of the mash tun. So I'll drain it out, get it all into the fermenter, uh, and then I will do a sparge in all three mash tuns as well. It seems silly to leave sugar on the table or in the mash tun, <laughs> as the case may be. Let me get that done, and then we can talk about yeast. So all of the fermenters are mashed out, sparged out, uh, and I did mess up and over sparge considerably. My gravity is only uh, 1.048. Not huge, not a big problem, whatever, I'll deal with it. Uh, but while that's cooling down to pitching temperature, 
we can talk about yeast. Now this video is sponsored by Angel Yeast, so obviously I'm gonna be using an Angel Yeast product, but to keep it in the spirit of the mongrel whiskey, I'm only gonna allow myself to choose from Angel Yeast products that I already have open. AG2 Distillers Malt. Uh, I keep all of these in Ziploc bags in the fridge to uh, extend their life a little bit. But AG2 Distillers Malt to me is more of a traditional American corn whiskey. It's good, not really what I'm going for here. I'm gonna push it more towards the Scotch side of things. Uh, Red Label, ferments at high heat and super fast. Once again, not really what I'm after here. I also have a couple of different beer yeasts and English ale yeast, which throw some tasty esters for distilling, but probably not what I'm after here. Oh, I've got two Red Labels open. <laughs> Whoops, I don't know how I managed that. Uh, and Yellow Label which was going to be my fallback if for whatever reason that didn't match properly, but we've got full conversion, so that would be a waste, which leaves AM1 Distillers Malt, which is fast becoming my go-to. In fact, it already has become my go-to. Uh, anytime I want to make something kind of scotch-like, single malty, this seems like the go today. But a huge thank you to Angel for sponsoring this video, and if you want to check out uh, some more information about their products, I'll stick a link in the description down below. So that fermented out completely dry in four days, which is fast, uh, but the gravity at 1055 was a little bit lower, so it's not entirely surprising. Uh, and I did keep it at 30, 32 uh, degrees Celsius the whole time as well. Um, so, you know, I had that going for it. But, uh, time to get this into the still so we can distill it. I'm just gonna be running this as a bunch oh, of stripping runs. <laughs> Gonna keep it pretty simple for this one. Double pot stilt, I think is the ticket. Uh, but I did fill that boiler relatively full, so let me grab some butter. The first dripping run is up and running. I'm thinking I'm probably gonna have to do two, maybe even three of these. We'll see what the spirit's tasting like and smelling like and how far through I get with the second stripping run. Uh, but I am flirting with a puke at the moment. So I'm just gonna run the still slowly um, for perhaps 15-20 minutes and then I can probably crank the power up. So there's no plates in the still at the moment, uh, I'm just using the sight glasses to be able to spot if, uh, if a puke is coming. The T500 stainless pot was the only thing that was stainless or glass I had large enough and empty to hold those low ones today. So I was holding them in there and uh, they were already in there so I figured why not just throw the lid on and still them in the T500. So that's what I'm doing, uh, I've already collected this much, four shots. I, I, I didn't measure it, I just took a, a large amount of chuck that out. Uh, and I'm in the middle of collecting the beginning of heads. Now because it is a relatively large charge and it's all low ones in here, I'm running the T500 a little bit faster than I normally would. Uh, but there we have it. I guess I'll just buckle myself in and see what happens. It's about, I don't know, 45 minutes, an hour later, uh, and I now have collected this much heads, and I think it is time to make the switch. Hold on, borderline. So what I'm gonna do is switch to a, a glass or two of just collecting a small amount. I'm pretty sure this is still heads. Uh, and then once I'm totally sure I'm into the, uh, the hearts, I'll switch over to a larger container. I finished up distillation last night and I ended up cutting from hearts to tails at 50% ABV. I went a little bit lower into the tails uh, because we do have a decent amount of uh, peated malt in here and that was starting to come over really nicely. At about 50% it started to get a little bit wet dog-like so I decided to cut it at that point in time. Uh, I proofed it down to 55% ABV. Now it's time to uh, give it a taste so I can decide what sort of maturation treatment this is going to get. Uh, but first, a huge, huge thank you to the Patreons. Thank you so much Patreons for being the people that support me day in, day out. And uh, I know I'm going to get to see a few of you in person at the Texas Distillery Takeover which is coming up super freaking fast. I'm excited. For those of you that missed out because of geographic, you know, reasons, I totally understand. Uh, if it goes the way I hope it's going to go, it won't be the last one I do, and I won't only be doing them in Texas. Anyway, 
there is a slight oxidized kind of caramelly note, which I wonder is coming from old grain. I don't know, I'm not sure. I have tasted that in uh, whiskey before. I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing. I think after uh, maturation, it's gonna be, gonna be fine. Slight amount of smoke on the nose, but the more predominant uh, aromas are probably the specialty malts at this point in time. So especially the, uh, the caramel, the Shepherd's Delight, which is kind of sweet and um, like Christmas cake fruit kind of stuff. And the chocolate malt is coming through as well and accentuating those other things. So uh, it's presenting very much like uh, a darker chocolate pushing through almost to coffee. And it's light, it's subtle, but it's 100% in there. Let's uh, give it a taste. More of the same on the palate, very similar to the aroma, um, which seems like a silly thing to say, but often it's not. <laughs> the big difference is there's a lot more smoke on the palate. It'll be interesting to see what happens to that while it maturates. Um, so I'm, I'm saying that this is actually pretty damn good. And I was, you know, I was trying to decide how to maturate it. If it turned out really well, uh, I was gonna put it into a barrel. If it turned out average, I was just gonna stick it in glass with staves. I think, honestly, I think this is worthy of a barrel. I'm really interested to see what happens with this much specialty malt and all these crazy things uh, with a long-term maturation. So I think, I think that's what I'm gonna do. Uh, the barrel is not entirely full. It's full up to about here. So it's, you know, I don't know, like seven eighths full <laughs> or something like that. Uh, this video has been really interesting to me for two reasons. One is that I didn't plan for this to happen, but I'm happy it happened. People are always, you know, asking me about recipes. Oh, give me a recipe that I can do with this. And I, I think that this kind of shows that as long as you have a kind of a solid understanding of the fundamentals of mashing, like of course the recipe matters. Of course the quality of the ingredients matter. Could I have made this, you know, 10%, 15%, 20% better with really fresh ingredients and a very precise recipe knowing exactly what I, you know, what I was going to put in there? Of course. But you can get an 80% result, which is still... I think gonna be phenomenal in a year and a half, two years time, without all of that. <laughs> and number two, it's showing me not to be scared of old malt. Yeah, the diastatic power is gonna be a little bit lower. Yeah, it's not gonna be as fresh, but as long as you store it well, uh, as long as you look after it while it's sitting around, especially, you know, that it's uh, whole and not crushed, it's gonna be fine. Anyway, if you've made a mongrel recipe, something like this, please let us know in the comment section down below. That'd be awesome. Uh, if you have anything else to say, hints, tips, whatever you like, pop them in the comment section. That helps me out a whole lot. Other things that help me out are liking this video. That's a big help. Uh, and of course, subscribing. So I'll catch you next time, guys. Keep on chasing the craft. See ya.